2,000 years ago, on the shores of Northwest Europe, lived a tribe called the Anglii, ancestors of the English-speaking peoples. The Roman historian Tacitus said they were one of seven tribes who sacrificed to the goddess Mother Earth by drowning people in bogs. In Denmark, more recently, the descendants of those people, digging for peat, have made some remarkable discoveries. Victims of these tribes have been perfectly preserved in the bog. This man was strangled. This man's throat was cut. It's hard to imagine that the language of this savage people would one day become the most widely spoken in the world. A Hindu temple might seem a strange place to start the story of English. But chanting in the holy language, Sanskrit, these worshippers are closer to English than you might imagine. Our word divine resembles their word deva. The surprising connection between English and Sanskrit was discovered at the end of the 18th century by a British judge stationed in Calcutta, Sir William Jones. Jones found that the English father resembles the Sanskrit pita, the Greek pater, and the Latin pater. Other basic words like mother, three, me, new, and seven convinced Jones that they were all part of the same language family. Perhaps as old as Stonehenge, the prehistoric origins of what Jones called this common source are as remote and obscure as this Neolithic ruin. This common source is the parent of what scholars call the Indo-European group of languages. Reaching out as far as India and the Hebrides, it's given us European languages like Latin and its descendants French and Spanish, the Celtic languages of Ireland, Scotland and Wales, the Slavic languages of Russia and Poland, and the Germanic tongues like Danish, Dutch, and English. The Indo-Europeans probably lived in Central Europe. Gradually, the Germanic tribes, the ancestors of English, moved westwards. Eventually settling along the shores of Northern Europe, they included the Jutes, Angles, Saxons, and Frisians in what is now Denmark, Germany, and Holland. Today, there are still 300,000 Frisian speakers in northern Holland. Martin Sittema speaks a language that is often closer to English than Dutch, closer still to Old English. It's so close, there's even a rhyme that works in both languages. It goes, good butter and good cheese are good English and good Frise. Most people associate Friesland with cows. They might be surprised to know that Frieslanders use the same word. That is ko. And the words for bread or lamb. That is a lamb. And for wheat, sheep, or goose. That is an uh, 
goes. And ox or foal? And in a faller. And how about house or boat? In a boat. And similar words for fork, bull or pole? In a bale. And corn or dung? In tonga. And green or rain? In a rain. And even a cup of coffee? A cup of coffee. The English language arrived in Britain in A.D. 449. The invading Frisians, Angles, Saxons and Jutes spoke closely related languages which came to be known as Anglo-Saxon. In the words of the chronicler, Angles and Saxons came from the east. Across the broad sea they sought Britain. Si dan east an hider, engle an siaxa up bekomen, of verbrade brimmu brutunu sochton. Proud warmongers overcame the strangers. The mighty earls conquered the land, eager for glory. Ulonka we smithas, welchas of verkomen, eorlas arquata, earda bejeata. Britain had recently been abandoned by the Romans, leaving the Celtic inhabitants to look to their own defences. Porchester was part of a defensive chain built by the Romanized Britons because of the growing frequency of Saxon attacks, so frequent that this coast came to be known as the Saxon Shore. Perhaps the most successful resistance to the Anglo-Saxons was mounted by one Artorius, the legendary King Arthur. But in the long run, the Anglo-Saxons were unstoppable. In the bloody wars that ensued, the native Britons were driven into the forests and hills of the West. There was so little cultural contact that English, which is borrowed from virtually everyone, took fewer than a dozen words from the original Britons. The final insult was that the Anglo-Saxons called the people they had conquered the Wielas, meaning foreigners, from which we get Wales. The names of Celtic rivers, Avon, Thames, and places like Kent and Dover have survived. And a few words for unfamiliar landscape features like coombe for valley and crag for high rock were borrowed by the invaders. When the Anglo-Saxons invaded, the Celts fled in many directions to Ireland, France, and to Wales. The Celtic Britons were also part of the Indo-European language tree. Echoes of their language are heard in modern Welsh. The Celts who fled from Britain to France called their new homeland Brittany. Jean Leroux is a Breton-speaking onion seller from Brittany who still makes an annual visit to Wales. Breton and Welshmen speak varieties descended from the same Celtic language. Even today, these Celtic cousins still use words that are common to both languages. Another Celtic tradition is the making of coracles. Peter and Ronnie Davis prefer to discuss their ancient craft in Welsh, and when they speak English, it's with strong Welsh accents. My family's been fishing with coracles for about 300 years. Well, uh, you just can't pick it up 